welcome back to what is now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast on Leadership with Scott Miller, sponsored by the Franklin Covey Company, the most trusted leadership development firm in the world. My name is Scott Miller, and after five years, I am still privileged and honored to be sitting in this seat as the host of Franklin Covey's podcast, where each week, twice a week now, on Tuesdays and Fridays, we release what we think are hopefully helpful and occasionally riveting conversations that are intended to be investments in your life as a leader, perhaps in your role as a formal leader inside a large multinational company. Maybe you are a mid or senior level leader. Perhaps you're on the front line and you've just moved from being an individual contributor into the role of being a leader. Perhaps you have a side hustle or you're a stay-at-home parent or you're retired and you are a leader in some other, perhaps even more important role in the life of those around you, this podcast is intended to pour into you twice a week, both audio and video. Each week, we interview famous celebrities, book authors, researchers, business titans, four-star generals, people that have perhaps, through no fault of their own, survived a traumatic experience and lived to tell about it and share what they have learned to help all of us navigate what are tough lives we're living around the world. And today's guest does exactly fit that bill. His name is Kevin Hines, and he's authored a book called Cracked, Not Broken, Surviving and Thriving After a Suicide Attempt. Kevin is a international speaker, author, and mental health advocate. And today, this is going to be a very raw and real conversation. So listener, viewer, um, disclaimer, uh, the conversation we're going to have today is about mental health, it's about suicidal ideation, it's about the process of the pain and drama and trauma that countless people experience with uh, thinking of taking their life, people that have had loved ones, colleagues, members of their family successfully take their life or attempted to do so, and how do you struggle and deal with that. Now, Kevin is not a licensed mental health therapist. He's not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. He works as a national advocate for people with mental health issues and works closely with licensed professionals. I think you'll find his story to be gripping and hopeful. Kevin, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you here. I love this t-shirt you're wearing. Be here tomorrow. Kevin Hines' story. Kevin, this is going to be a very vulnerable and real conversation. The book you've written called Cracked Not Broken, Surviving and Thriving After a Suicide Attempt with, of course, a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. What I would like to do is before we actually get to the story of your suicide attempt, your unsuccessful suicide attempt, you did something I told you off camera quite lovingly in the book. Before we get into your early childhood and then the process of you dealing with your own mental health, will you talk about who you've, in essence, dedicated this book to that cannot share their story? Absolutely. I dedicated the book uh, to all of the individuals who have leapt off the Golden Gate Bridge and died by suicide that way. And, and all the folks that have died by suicide of any means who no longer are able to share or tell their stories. 99.99% of the people who've leapt off the Golden Gate Bridge are gone. Uh, their families mourn them each and every waking moment of every single day. The book Crack Not Broken is for them and those who love them. And I did that because uh, I've lost 17, yeah, 17 people now that I care deeply about to suicide. Um, and so I, I'm very familiar with that loss. And they're either people I care deeply about or people that I love. I lost my first teacher, uh, my, my favorite, favorite, favorite teacher, Mr. John Fennell, my theater director in high school. He was my hero. He was my mentor. He was my friend. He was like a second father figure to me. And he took his life seven months before I left off the Golden Gate Bridge to attempt to take mine. Kevin, you have wrestled with some mental health challenges would you take a few minutes and name them? Because I guarantee you everyone around the world that is watching and listening to this podcast will be riveted over the next 35 plus minutes and has someone in their life, if not themselves, has a parent, has a colleague, has a loved one, has a child that is wrestling with a massive increase in social anxiety, depression, suicide ideation. 
Will you talk a little bit about and name perhaps your own mental health struggles so people know and can appreciate what your own journey has been like? Absolutely. And, and I'll say this, we in the Western world, we, we, we formalize and we label all of these things very clearly. Um, uh, some other places in the world do not look at them as a mind-body connection. But I will say that I live with and have lived with, by definition, severe anxiety, depression, mania, panic attacks, hallucinations, auditory and visual, seeing and hearing things nobody else can see or hear, believing them to be inherently real, paranoid delusions, uh, believing that people are out to get me, trying to hurt me, trying to kill me, um, uh, chronic thoughts of suicide since my attempt in the year 2000 off the Golden Gate Bridge. And, 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 and this is all by definition called bipolar type one with psychotic features. Bipolar depression, uh, the ups, the downs, the many of the depression, and then the psychosis that follows. Um, and, and it's something that I've lived with for the, for the better part of uh, the last two decades and some change. Uh, but I'm really uh, focused on staying stable on an even keel to the best of my ability. That being said, I still struggle every day. I have symptoms on a regular basis, and I do still have chronic thoughts of suicide. I just have the tools, the techniques, the wherewithal, and the self-awareness to survive them. Kevin, you opened the book, Cracked Not Broken, which I, I'd argue is a, this is a leadership book, this is a self-help book, this is a parenting book, this is a friend book, how to be a better friend, how to be an advocate, how to know what the signs are of people around you and yourself. We'll get to that in a moment. You opened this story with a incomprehensibly unrelatable story about you in a hotel room with, I believe, your then brother who passed, I think, when he was two. Would you not hold back the details and talk about that opening story in your book? And what connection, if anything, do you think that has had to your ongoing mental health? So in my infancy, I'm adopted. In my infancy, my, my biological parents, after they had me and my brother 10 months apart, uh, Irish twins, after they had us, uh, they succumbed to hardcore drugs and alcohol. And frankly, uh, they would die very tragically from those things and, and, and depression and me mental pain, brain pain, what, as, as I call it. And in our infancy, we were fed Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk, what our parents could steal. We lived in and out of crack motels, the kind of places you paid for by the hour. And if you didn't, you were out. And mom and dad did whatever they had to do on that hour, by that hour, to keep a roof over our heads. They didn't neglect us every day, leaving us on a box spring for a mattress over a concrete slab floor, lying next to dangerous drug paraphernalia, sharp metal objects had we touched could have killed us. Had we have fallen to the concrete slab floor beneath us, we could have easily cracked our heads open and died. They didn't leave us every day because they didn't love us. The opposite was true. They were trying to keep us safe from the outside world. That's where my life began, truly humble beginnings. Um, and it absolutely played a pivotal role, that traumatic infancy in the rest of my life. If you look at the ACE exams, I've scored a nine on the ACE exams, adverse childhood experiences. Um, and so I'm very lucky to be alive today from what I did in the year 2000, but also uh, the struggles I have had my entire life from my gut to brain health issues, for, to my, you know, diagnosed mental illness, all of these things um, were, 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 they, they came from my lack of real great nurturing uh, and care as an infant. Kevin, I'm not familiar with the ACE acronym in this scale. Can you reorient myself and viewers and listeners to this ACE scale? The ACE study, uh, was a study that was done to determine the trauma of a child that occurred uh, sometimes pre-verbal, sometimes post-verbal, whether the child could talk or not, whether they were old enough to talk. Um, so for example, abuse, neglect, whether that be sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, neglect, the drug use of parents before the child was born, all of these things come into play for the ACE study, adverse child experiences. So the things that the child experienced um, before they were able to take care of themselves. Um, and and, and in, in doing an ACE study as, as an adult, I scored very high. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an out of 10 scale. I was a nine. Um, higher is worse, obviously. Higher um, is worse. I want to spend lots of time after you tell the story 
of your suicide attempt to talk about signs of people in our life that might have suicide ideation so that everyone can help those around them or ask for help if they are experiencing this. First, I'd like you to define colloquially for our listeners what suicide ideation means because that's a word I hear a lot. It's a phrase I hear a lot, but I don't know that I fully understood the gripping impact it can have on your brain and how you actually convince yourself that you don't deserve to live, that you do need to die, and it becomes almost a will to do that. Can you talk maybe a little bit clinically around what does suicide ideation really mean, and then we'll pivot to your gripping story. Absolutely. So suicidal ideation can come in many forms. It's actually very common, and millions and millions of people around the world deal with and live with it. Uh, For me personally, I began to become suicidal when I thought that I was a true burden to all who love me. I got to believing in a paranoid delusion state of being that everyone around me, my family, my friends, my loved ones, my colleagues, aided me and wanted me gone from this world. In believing that, I was lying to myself. I was telling myself the greatest lies I ever told. Suicidal ideations are the greatest liars we know. What I understand today is I don't have to listen to them. I didn't know that back then. And so when someone experiences suicidal ideation, they can experience it on a mild level from the idea like, I just don't want to be here anymore, which is where mine started. I just don't want to exist. I don't like this life anymore. They can express themselves in that language to other people, which a lot of people find cryptic and don't quite understand if they don't know the history of suicidal crisis. Then someone can get to the point where they believe themselves to be a burden to all who care about them, all who love them, and they actually get to a point where they believe the people around them want them gone. Um, and they believe that if they were just out of their lives, those individuals' lives would be easier, better without them. That's, of course, false. But you can't see that in the face of such deep and desperate emotional and mental pain, brain pain. And so uh, suicidal ideation can come from the loss of a job, the loss of a relationship, the loss of a loved one, and you can be grieving and you can start to think, I should just take my life. It can come from any form of trauma. And and for a long time uh, in in, in older years, people thought that the only ones with trauma were those combat veterans or people who've been through physical trauma, and people don't quite get, even today yet, that trauma can come in thousands upon thousands of forms for different kinds of people in different ways. A traumatic thing for you is is different than a traumatic thing for me. And so we can't minimize or invalidate people's trauma that leads to suicidal ideation, the idea that you have to exit this world because you are no longer worthy of it. And that gets you to a place of suicidal action. I actually never say successful or unsuccessful suicides because in my opinion, there is no such thing as a successful suicide. It's the worst thing that can ever happen to any family and no, there's no success about it, but that's a, that's a language issue. I also never say someone committed suicide. I say they died by suicide just like anyone would die of any other organ diseased. Um, Your brain is an organ just like every other organ in the body. It too can become diseased. And when you have brain pain, you can become suicidal. Kevin, that was beautifully said. Would you take some time and with as much detail as you're comfortable, share the the emotional state you were in prior to in your teens attempting um, to take your life? What happened? Yes. And then walk us through that. Absolutely. Uh, You know, here's the thing. Uh, from 17 years of age to 19, it was this <clears throat> absolutely rocky road. I would skyrocket into a manic euphoric natural high caused not by recreational drugs, but caused by the misaligning chemicals in my brain. But once you go up, you must come down. And I'd come crashing down every week into this dark abyss of depression and pain, brain pain. And I would end up at the age of 19 very soon before my physical attempt off the Golden Gate Bridge, maybe even a couple of days, I would become drastically suicidal. Now, I had thought about it before. I had made minor attempts before, the year before, but I had never come to a place of like a drastic attempt that would end up in me potentially losing my life and leaving my family forever. And when this really became an option for me was when my teacher, John Fennell, took his life. Uh, by, by way of by way of a firearm, and uh, he took his life, and he he left his wife and his two daughters, and 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 I I can never forget 
going to his funeral and being in the car with my father at stop and go traffic, we were at a halt. And my father turning to me at, at a stop and saying, Kevin, you can never do anything like this. You would never do anything like this. We love you. You have an obligation to your family to be here. We need you. And that was seven months before I left off the Golden Gate Bridge to attempt to take my life. And I said, Dad, I would never do that. I would never want to hurt you or the family like that. And I meant it from my heart. Seven months later, it was a different story. The brain pain had become so great, so unimaginable, so inescapable that I believed I had to die. And I believe there was no other option. I'll ask you this, and I, I really want a vocal answer from you if you don't mind. What is the one thing you want to happen? when you find yourself in excruciating physical pain, what do you want that pain to do? End. End, stop, go away. That's physical pain. My argument is that brain pain is at the very least 300,000 times worse than any physical pain we've ever experienced because people all around us invalidate it. Because I cannot see it, it must not be real. Snap out of it, get over it, move on. Pull yourself up from your bootstraps. It's all in your head. When you're darn right, it's in my head. That's where my brain is, the single most powerful organ in my body. And so to wrap that all up is, is to say that, you know, uh, in my experience, right before I leapt off the Golden Gate Bridge, I was in the greatest part of despair in my entire life. I was in the greatest depression I'd ever experienced. I was having manic episodes simultaneously. I was a wreck. And I wish I knew back then what I know today, that my thoughts do not have to become my actions. They can simply be my thoughts. And that suicidal ideations are the greatest liars we know, and we don't have to listen to them. Suicide is never the solution to our problem. It is the problem. So you're in your late teens and you start divesting yourselves of some of your most precious items to, I think, your siblings. Uh, start with that and then talk us through what happened on the bridge. So this is very common. People who are suicidal become what's called elated. They're happy that the pain is finally going to end. It's a, it's a chemical reaction in the brain. You, you realize, I'm going to take my life. I'm going to be out of this pain. I'm going to be free. At least that's what you think in your mind. What you're not recognizing is that you're leaving pain and a wake of destruction for the rest of eternity for all those left behind. And what you don't understand is that you're not taking away the pain. You're just taking away your life. You won't exist to experience something better, something more hopeful. Um, Kevin, can and, you stop there a second? Can you, can you help our listeners and viewers know, are there any statistics or is there data that shows that suicide tends to be a long-term process? Is it more impulsive? Is there like a period of time that most or many people start to plan it and therefore we can look for the signs? Is there anything that you could share with us around that? So data is changing constantly, but I will say this, uh, more, more seven to 10 year old children are dying by suicide in this world than ever before in the history of humankind. Um, more, more white males in America die by suicide more females still attempt. Um, uh, more black children are dying by suicide than ever before in the history of the United States and the world. Uh, and so, so there's a lot of things going on at the same time. Um, a, a lot of people find a time in their early teens to late teens, all the way up to the age of 24 and 25 where they're contemplating suicide. But there's also a, a really high rate in people's 60s and 70s because they feel like they have no purpose. So there's a, there's a, it, it really does vary and it's, it's a very vast and complex situation that is suicide right around the world. So, that, so I don't have all of that data, but I will say those are the common themes. And I will also say, when you're looking at your leadership podcast, you're the best in the world. I will say that you know, for, 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 for all of the um, HR developers, or HR departments in the world and companies all around the world, we have to start looking at the betterment of our employees and our employee base because if they're not well, they can't do their job. And we are looking at, I think, what is going to be a loss of $66 trillion due to mental health outages in work and production uh, by the year 2030 if we do not begin to tackle brain and mental health in the workforce to take care of people's 
health and well-being while they're still stable before they get to a place of suicidal ideation or great depression or anxiety. We need to start working upstream. And one of the things that really gets my goat is that every, everyone in every, most businesses have this EAP program, but so many people don't know about the services that are being offered. And most people don't want them to use those services because they want them at work. Well, well my wife and my team are working on development of, <coughs> of, of efforts to to change that globally and to allow businesses to care for people's brain and mental health before they get to a place of self-destruction or self-death. And I think that that's something we need to tackle as a society, not just a workforce, in general, is getting people before they become suicidal, help them understand that if they become suicidal, these are the things that help save their life and keep them safe from death. And these are the things when they become mentally unstable that they can utilize to get to safety, hope, healing, and recovery. Kevin, I wanna go back to the bridge in a moment here, but my question really centers around, is there any data that shows that um, X percent of suicide is an impulsive act in a moment, or it's premeditated, so to speak, where it happens over a couple of hours or days or weeks? Is there anything you could share about that? I don't know the, the exact data. I will tell you this. My suicide attempt that was drastic off the Golden Gate Bridge, I only physically decided to take my life the night before. Yeah. I had thought about it. It was a, in a piece of my mind. I had perseverated on it. The thoughts were inescapable, but the actually determination to go to the Golden Gate Bridge and leap off to my death occurred only on the 24th before the 25th, my attempt. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Let's go back to the couple of days before and let's talk about the actual attempt. So a couple of days before, um, um, my father and I were arguing and having a hard time uh, communicating. And uh, I was I was having these paranoid delusions where I thought people were out to get me and trying to hurt me and trying to kill me. I was skyrocketing to manic behavior, um, being grandiose and, and, and thinking I could do things that were absolutely impossible or implausible, not likely. And, and then on September 24th, I sat at my desk and I penned my note, my note to my mom, dad, brother, sister, family, friends. I told them I love them. I asked for their forgiveness. I said I was sorry. Uh, I put that note in my shoulder bag, shoulder bag by the door at six in the morning. I entered my father Patrick's room and I told him I loved him. I thought for the very last time, I convinced him that day I would be fine. I made my way out to the Golden Gate Bridge on September 25th. Um, on the bus ride there, that's when I became ambivalent. That's when I began to think, what am I doing? I don't want to die. I've got to say something, but I couldn't vocalize my pain. I was stuck. The voices in my head, the auditory hallucinations were so loud and so unbearable uh, and telling me I had to die, that I had no other option, and those voices would win the day. You got to the Golden Gate Bridge, and what happened? I get to the Golden Gate Bridge. Everyone, 100 people on that bus, deboard the bus, and and I'm crying on the bus. Now I've been on this bus, I've been yelling aloud at the voices in my head, leave me alone, I don't wanna die, why do you hate me so much, what have I ever done to you? And, and, and all these people are staring at me, but no one's saying anything. We get to the bus and one man to my left says to the fellow next to him while pointing at me with his thumb, with a smile on his face while laughing at my pain, what the hell's wrong with that kid? Very apathetic. And, and it, it really was the, was the nail in the, you know, at, for lack of a better term, coffin. And, I, I, I remember looking at the bus driver after everyone had deboarded, hoping he would see my pain, the waterfall of tears coming down my face, and he just motioned for me to get off the bus. I walked across the Golden Gate Bridge walkway. I paced back and forth for 40 minutes, wishing, hoping, and praying someone would stop me. No one did. A woman asked me to take her picture several times with her digital camera. I did that, and that was the moment I lost all hope and said, absolutely, nobody cares. The greatest lie I'd ever told myself. And uh, the voice in my head said, jump now, and I did. Uh, but that's not the important part of the story, really. This is the, the fact that the millisecond my hands left the rail and my legs cleared it, I had an instantaneous regret for my actions and the absolute recognition that I just made the greatest mistake of my life, and it was likely too late. For 99.9% .9 of the people who've leapt off that bridge, it's been too late. They're gone. And I fell 240 feet, 25 stories, closing in on 80 miles per hour, nearing the speed of terminal velocity in four seconds, praying on the way down that I would live. Um, but it was that instant regret that I want to focus on. 
because all around the world, that instant regret from people who have survived suicide of means of all kinds, moderate, mild to severe, have recounted that same instant regret. It's almost instinctual because we are designed, human beings are designed to thrive in the face of struggle, strife, and pain. We are designed to survive. That's why you hear about the, the individual uh, in 27 days who falls down the crevasse in the mountain mountaintops and severs his leg and survives and makes it out and, and lives because we're designed to continue to forge forward. Um, and we're not designed to die by our hands. It's not what we're meant to do. If, if we understand this scientifically speaking, we have a one in 400 trillionth of a chance to be birthed into this world in the first place, to simply exist. We're not meant to die by our hands. It's something that humankind has developed over ages because of pain. We have to teach people how to survive seemingly immeasurable, inescapable pain. Kevin, without getting too macabre, that instant regret, you realized that you were headed down head first, and you felt like that if you actually hit the water head first, you knew you would die. And so I think you sort of reversed your, your course of action in terms of where your body was. Talk a bit about that and what happened um, on the way down. You talk in your book about what it feels like to be falling that fast. Share some of that, and then we'll actually talk about how your journey can help others who are dealing with this trauma of their own nature and how their loved ones and leaders and colleagues can help them and ask the right questions and provide the right support. Hmm. So I threw my head back midair uh, because I knew if I hit head first, I would break my neck or sever my head and die. What people don't understand is that the majority of people who leap off the Golden Gate Bridge die upon impact. It's a very violent death. Um, there is only one way to survive it. I'm not going to mention that because I don't want people to get ideas. Um, but everyone who has survived, survived in the exact same position. I'll leave it there. Um, hitting the water, breaking my back immediately. I shattered my T12, L1, L2. I missed severing my spinal cord by two millimeters. I went down 70 feet beneath the water surface. I opened my eyes and I was drowning. I didn't want to drown. I didn't want to die. I realized I didn't want to die. I realized I made the greatest mistake in my life. And I kept swimming to the surface as fast as I could, praying that I would live. I got closer and closer to the lit circle water above me. I didn't think I was going to make it. I started to convulse. My eyes began to roll on the back of my head. Um, and I said to myself, Kevin, you can't die here. If you die here, no one will ever know you didn't want to. No one will ever know you knew you made a mistake. I broke the surface of the water, took a breath, bobbed up and down and prayed, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. A sea lion came to my aid in the water and kept me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. That's been corroborated by witnesses and the Coast Guard. Um, and that's why I have this sea lion on my chest. This is Herbert. He saved my life. I named him. <laughs> and um, this creature literally was the only being to come to my aid when no human would. Um, I'm on every YouTube list for animals that have saved humans around the world. So uh, I'm very grateful to be alive. I'm very appreciative that I get to exist past the day I tried to die. Uh, and my goal in life is to spread my message of hope, healing, and recovery from brain pain all around the world, which I've been doing for the last 23 years with my lovely wife, Margaret. I travel the world sharing my story to groups of all kinds, of all walks of life, companies of all kinds. And I inspire people through my message to keep going no matter the pain they might be in. This message benefits people because there's so many aspects to it, from a traumatic infancy to substance misuse and alcohol issues as a, as a young adult, adolescent, to, uh, to chronic brain and mental pain, to chronic thoughts of suicide, to the eating disorders I lived with, to all of the things I've dealt with, to being adopted, to being in foster care, um, all of these things play a role in reaching audiences of all kinds. And people seem to always find a point of relatability in the story and a point of connection. And so it's been very uh, hopeful for me. And probably the most therapeutic thing I've ever done is to tell stories. Kevin, let's re use our remaining five or so minutes on two topics. I'd like you to kind of divide it in half. Would you take the next two or three minutes and speak directly to those listeners and viewers that are relating to some portion of your story. It's quite spectacular in terms of, you know, all of the 
health challenges and trauma you've experienced, nine on this 10 point scale. Can you speak to people that either have some suicidal thoughts, perhaps they've had an attempt in the past, perhaps they are so severe that they actually are envisioning it and thinking it's the right thing to do. Speak to them about what they should do. How do they differentiate between their thoughts and their behaviors? What kind of help can they get? And then separately we'll talk about those around them. Okay, so for everyone out there right now, listening, watching, viewing, and, 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 and subscribing to this podcast, uh, if you are in brain pain, if you are struggling with suicidal ideation, if you are constantly thinking about it or you, you have chronic thoughts of suicide or they've just been burgeoning thoughts that, that just came up just recently, stop. Breathe. In through the nose four seconds. Hold for four seconds. Release six to eight seconds. Pursed lips like a whistle but no sound. Do that 30 more times. Calm your brain. Calm your mind. Calm your body. We are, we are all going to pass away. It's the essence of life. We live and we die. None of us have cracked the code to immortality. Give yourself time plus hard work for things to change. Everybody wants the uberfication of life right now. They want their groceries right now. They want their weight to lower right now. They want that one pill that's gonna solve that problem. They want their mental health to stay better immediately. No, that's not how it works. You have to put in the time, put in the effort, do the research, understand what things benefit your brain and your body to heal your mind. Do the work. Change your perspective, change your perception. Stay here. Life is worth living if and when you do the hard work to change your brain and change your life. I've done the work. And these are the things that keep me free and alive when I'm suicidal. And I'm suicidal often. I have chronic thoughts of suicide have for the last 23 years. Number one, I look into the mirror, any mirror, anywhere, and I say, my thoughts don't have to become my actions. They can simply be my thoughts. The second thing I do is turn to anyone willing to listen to me, anyone at all. And I say four simple but very effective words. I need help now. It's my shorthand for when I'm suicidal. I say it to my wife. I say it to my father. I say it to my friends. I say it to complete strangers. I've been at the Atlanta airport where people have, uh, TSA agents have brought me into a locked room when I said I was suicidal, done a threat assessment, and I've gotten the help I need because I asked for it. And I don't stop asking for it until someone is willing to empathize with my pain. By the sheer probability of the number of people you turn to, someone will be willing to help keep you safe in that moment. And for all the people who love those individuals with suicidal ideation, I have two things for you. Number one, get the book, Loving Someone with Suicidal Thoughts. Get, get the book. It'll change your life. It'll change their life. Loving Someone with Suicidal Thoughts. Next, understand that these thoughts are actually quite normal. They don't make someone abnormal. Ask the question to someone you think is suicidal. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? And do you have the means? Those three questions are proven by the AI algorithm from the crisis text line to get a more honest answer than the question, are you thinking of suicide? Because by definition, uh, suicide is a taboo term and they get a more honest answer than are you thinking of self-harm because self-harm is not suicide, it's self-harm. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? Do you have the means? If you get that the person is suicidal, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to take them straight to a psych ward. Maybe it just means you have to sit next to them and be with them in that moment and listen to understand, not to respond. And sometimes if it's acute, you need to get them to a physically safe place from themselves. Kevin, we could spend a lot of hours talking about this because it's such a, a, a crisis in the world. Just this morning, I was on a phone call with a Franklin Covey colleague and she revealed to me that one of her dear friends in her, I think, early 40s took her life two weeks ago. No signs, did not know. And she then revealed that another friend of hers, daughter, who was 16, attempted without success to take her life just a week ago. Went to a trauma center and now is in a mental health recovery and the mother is just you know, sort of despondent. How did I not know? How was I unaware that this was developing? How could I not have known? Why don't we take the last two minutes, let's speak to parents, specifically to parents. Parents of adolescents, parents of teenagers, parents of 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 year olds. If you're a parent, you want them to know what are the signs, 
maybe even the silent signs that, that one of your children is struggling and needs help? So to parents of all walks of life and to parents of all ages, um, we must have the conversation about suicide at the breakfast, lunch, and dinner table. We must understand what our children are going through, are living with, and are dealing with. And the only way to do that is to ask the questions I, I promoted earlier. You have to ask the questions or you will not know. They will not put the thought in someone's mind who's not already thinking about it. That is a myth. They will give someone permission to speak on their pain and a pain shared is a pain halved. You have an open and honest conversation about suicide in your household and do it on a regular basis because you never know what someone's going through is being silent. That said, if they're having dramatic changes in behavior, if they're a good eater and they start eating very minimally, if they are a good sleeper and they start sleeping minimally or the reverse, the opposite, if they start getting a lot of weight, if they start diminishing their, their hygiene, all of these are signs. If they start talking about how they don't wanna be here anymore, they don't like life, they don't like this existence, they wanna just disappear, they wanna go somewhere else, those are signs. You have to look for the tiny things in behavior that are changing, but some people are gonna be very, very good at silencing their pain. So you have to say to them, use this terminology. Are you silencing your pain? Are you in pain constantly? And are you being quiet about it? Because I want to know because I love you. And I need you here. And you mean the world to me. And if you ever took your life, I'd be devastated for all of eternity. That's not putting guilt on the person. That's telling them the darndest truth. Tell your truth. Elicit a positive answer. Get them to speak on their pain. And if they're drastically suicidal, get them to safety, call 988, the lifeline, or text it, or text the crisis text line CNQR to 741-741. That stands for courage to talk about your mental health. Normalize the conversation of it. Ask the questions. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Have you made plans to take your life? Do you have the means? R is for recovery. I'm living proof. Kevin, on a 10-point scale, you are a 10 of courage. You are a 10 of vulnerability. You're a 10 of authenticity and... You're at 10 in terms of your generosity to talk about this. Your book is Cracked Not Broken, Surviving and Thriving After a Suicide Attempt. Kevin Hines, thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. I greatly appreciate it. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Mm -hmm.